Tonight, at least 20 dead in Thailand after a shooting rampage at a shopping mall. Australian evacuees from the epicentre of the coronavirus outbreak touched down in Darwin. A Senate inquiry to look into the possibility of a cancer cluster on the Bellarine Peninsula. And Port Ferry puts its best foot forward in a world record attempt. Looking out and seeing everybody smiling and doing that dance together was so much more than what I could hope for. Hello and welcome to ABC News Sunday. I'm Tamara O'Dine. A gunman who killed 26 people in Thailand has been shot dead by police after being cornered all night in a shopping centre. He was a soldier and is believed to have been angry over a financial dispute. The man killed his commanding officer before stealing weapons from a military camp and continuing his attack at a shopping mall. He shot and killed shoppers, explosions were heard and police closed off streets for hours in the city in Thailand's northeast. From there, South East Asia correspondent Amy Bainbridge reports. Traumatised and exhausted, hundreds of people escaped from the Terminal 21 mall as the gunman remained inside for hours in a standoff with police. Others who were injured in the shooting spree were rushed to hospital. 19-year-old supermarket employee Arm hid in a storeroom with his colleagues for eight hours. <laughs> The rescuers found a way to get us out. There are two ways into the supermarket, one at the front and one at the back. They looked at those options and showed us which way to run. Others waited throughout the night for news. I am very upset about what happened. I didn't think anything like this could happen. I've been working here for three years and nothing like this has happened before. And it wasn't until more than 17 hours later that the gunman was shot by police, relieving a terrified city. The gunman was identified as Thai soldier, 32-year-old Jakrapanth Toma. He's believed to have shot his commanding officer at a military base and then stole a Humvee and drove it to the Terminal 21 shopping centre, shooting at people along the way. The gunman killed and injured people in the street outside the mall before going in and taking hostages. Throughout his rampage, the shooter posted material on Facebook, which was then quickly taken down. This city is still emerging from the darkest of nights and the trauma of such a horrific event. Locals here have praised the efforts of police, the army and medical staff. Thailand's Prime Minister came to the hospital to visit those injured in the attack. Mass shootings in Thailand are extremely rare. A country has been left in shock and it may take a long time for people here to feel safe once again. And Amy Bainbridge joins us now from Thailand. Amy, has any more information come to light about the gunman's motive? Tomorrow, the police have said very little about the motives. All they've said at this stage is that there was some sort of property dispute that provoked this attack. But exactly how that then transpired from a shooting into multiple shootings and then a 17-hour standoff in the mall behind me is really yet to be explained. We expect to know more in coming days. Police have been at multiple locations throughout the city, including just here behind me today, the forensic police, that is, just piecing together uh, exactly the, the, the standoff the journey of this gunman and perhaps they will come up with some more answers soon. And Amy, more than 30 people have been hospitalised. Is the number of casualties expected to rise? Tam, we've just had some news a short time ago from the Thai government and yes, it has risen. Uh, they're now saying that there are 57 people who have been injured and the official number from the government is that 27 people have been killed. So that's an update that was provided a short time ago. Among those 57 people who are injured, eight people are undergoing surgery today. Uh, so the status of those patients is still unknown and the government is now also releasing some details about those uh, who have died. So. Uh, uh, the, the, the outpouring of grief here really is something you can feel. People really are extremely shocked that something like this could happen in this city. Amy Bainbridge in Thailand, thank you. 
Well, from the coronavirus epicentre to safe haven on the Australian mainland. The second chartered Qantas flight evacuating Australians from the Chinese city of Wuhan has touched down in Darwin. So far, all of the passengers are virus free, but that hasn't allayed the concerns of some people living near the quarantine centre. After being stranded in China for weeks, they finally touched down on Australian soil. 266 evacuees, including 101 children, from the coronavirus epicentre in Wuhan, arrive at Darwin Airport. They are all clinically well and they're in the process of being uh, transported to the Howard Springs uh, quarantine facility. They've been bussed out to a former workers' village on the outskirts of Darwin. These coronavirus evacuees are the first to be quarantined on the Australian mainland after the detention centre on Christmas Island reached capacity. A young girl on the island was being tested for the virus, but results today cleared her. There is no confirmed cases of the virus in the Christmas Island uh, quarantine population. The evacuees in Darwin, who faced a lengthy journey marred by delays, were tested for the virus five times, once in Wuhan, twice during the flight, again at the airport and once more out at the quarantine centre. Locals have reacted to their arrival with wariness. Uh, a lot of people are worried. So it's right next to a school. It's in Howard Springs. Um, a lot of people don't know enough about the virus. Oh, they're next door. They're right next door. My grandchildren go to that school. They don't actually know if anyone can break out of their place or not, and they've put it next to a school, so if anyone walks out, you know, worry for the kids that they'll get infected or not. Health authorities have promised there will be no risk posed to surrounding communities by those now in quarantine. I'm absolutely confident that all precautions have been taken to ensure that there's no risk to the community. Evacuees will be kept at least 300 metres away from local residents throughout their two-week stay. Matt Garrick, ABC News, Darwin. And the number of deaths from this strain of coronavirus has now surpassed the SARS outbreak 17 years ago. The global death toll is now at least 813, with all but one of those occurring in China. That's exceeded the total death toll from SARS. The total number of infections worldwide from the coronavirus is more than 37,000, including at least 22 Australians. But it looks like the spread of the virus could be slowing, with the number of reported new cases dropping in the last day. The World Health Organisation is calling for increased global coordination to stop further outbreaks. It's slow now, but it may accelerate. Mm -hmm. So while it's still slow, there is a window of opportunity that we should use to the maximum. It's appealed for nations, including Australia, to increase funding towards the global fight against the virus. The prospect of a new coal-fired power station being built in central Queensland is fuelling political tensions over climate change. The federal government will put $4 million towards a feasibility study into the multi-billion dollar project in a move that's being celebrated by regional nationals but is unnerving city Liberal colleagues. From Canberra, here's political editor Andrew Proben. The old Collinsville power station literally sits on top of coal. Mothballed last decade after more than 40 years service, the plant in central Queensland may have long cooled, but it remains a flashpoint. I believe that a coal-fired power station would have a very good chance of stacking up in a business case. His return to leadership spurned by Nationals colleagues last week. Barnaby Joyce now wants to lead a coal-fired revival. $4 million is going towards a feasibility study for a new $2 billion coal plant, a back-to-the-future proposal that puts Collinsville front and centre. We should be showing the world how we can use it in the cleanest and most efficient way. For manufacturing to go ahead, we need cheap, reliable power, and that's what this is about. The town's now part of the renewable energy revolution that challenges the economics of fossil fuel power. But that doesn't make it any less politically painful for the coalition. This is coal. Don't be afraid. Scott Morrison once brandished it to taunt Labor, but city Liberals are anxious the Prime Minister heeds public sentiment on climate change after a horror bushfire season. 
Not that it's just the coalition that finds the politics of coal uncomfortable. If industry decided to build a coal-fired power station, would you be happy with that or would you block that? Ultimately, this is a matter for the market. No, for um, the government to give approval. No. Well, sh well then, the, the normal environmental approval should, should apply and that process should apply. But so that's ultimately, a maybe? That's a maybe? Ultimately, the question here is for the government. If you say yes, you, you yeah, accept the science of climate change but then want to go and open up new coal mines, the Australian people punish you. There's no doubt that Labor's equivocation uh, over coal and coal generation at the last election uh, cost us votes uh, in the regions. Reconciling Australia's energy and export reliance on coal with voter sentiment on climate change has long troubled both sides of politics. But with the Nationals feeling threatened by One Nation and the Catter Party in regional Queensland, there won't be any let up in the tussle between coal and climate until that state's gone to the polls in late October. Andrew Probin, ABC News, Canberra. For years, Bellarine Peninsula locals have been concerned about what they believe to be the high instances of cancer and other illnesses in the area. Officials say there's no basis to the claims of a cancer cluster, but residents are now hoping a Senate inquiry will give some backing to their theories. It's a beautiful coastal town just 65 kilometres southwest of Melbourne, known for drawing in sea changes. But now Barwon Heads is getting a reputation for making people sick. 2017, January, I was diagnosed with breast cancer, um, hormone-driven uh, hormone breast cancer. Danielle Livingston's diagnosis came just after her son was found to have colitis and her daughter Crohn's disease, both autoimmune diseases. She believes her family's poor health is more than just bad luck. You would wake up in the morning and there'd be this low sort of fog all around bow and heads. It was just hanging over the wetlands. She suspects her health has been damaged by mosquito sprays, organophosphate pesticides used by the City of Greater Geelong Council and its predecessors since the 80s. It's not just cancers she and other locals are worried about. The data has shown that there's an elevation, a high elevation of disease, uh, of immune disease and cancers and lymphomas, which is not normal. Ross Harrison has been making surfboards in Barwon Heads for decades and he's been doing his own research after noticing a lot of young people in the area have died of cancer. Yeah, well, this is just the map of uh, all the cancer and immune disease in Barwon Heads. He says the data is skewed because those with holiday homes and people who've left the area aren't counted. When they present with disease, they present with that disease in their hometown, not here. So we have that data, he doesn't. Cancer clusters are rare and hard to prove. The local council says there's no scientific evidence, while a report from Victoria's chief health officer found that cancer rates on the Bellarine Peninsula are no higher than the national average. Hi Meg, I'm Sarah. Hi Meg. Despite the difficulty, a Senate inquiry was promised during the hard-fought election campaign for the marginal seat of Karangamite. Ross Harrison will present his own research to the inquiry. I believe that the authorities have failed us. I think uh, we have the epidemiological uh, data to show that they've failed us. Uh, the methodology to, um, to trace these illnesses, um, they've failed. I was shocked, really. Really shocked, yeah. You know, you think you're living the healthy outdoors lifestyle and all of a sudden you find out you've been poisoning, your kid's been poisoned for years and, and you have as well. Public submissions to the inquiry close at the end of the month. Stephen Schubert, ABC News, Barwon Heads. Heavy rains continuing to pound Sydney and parts of the New South Wales coast. For the details, Paul Higgins joins us. So, Paul, where have the heaviest falls been? Well, Tan, they've actually been in Sydney's west. It's been particularly wet there at the moment, with Olympic Park notching up 201 millimetres today. That's the equivalent of about a third of Melbourne's annual rainfall. In fact, 50 millimetres of that fell in just two hours this afternoon. Flash flooding has cut roads and train lines, and it's not just rain, too. Gusty winds have brought down trees, leaving 100,000 homes without power across Sydney. Evacuation warnings were issued for a number of communities in Sydney's west and northern beaches. 
The New South Wales South Coast was also hit, with emergency services working frantically to keep people safe. The good news is that the massive bushfire burning for 74 days in that area has been put out by the rain. And there's some good news for us. Some of that rain, as you can see, is heading for the firegrounds in far eastern Victoria overnight and in the morning. And I'll have more on the rain a little later, Tam. Thanks, Paul. You're watching ABC News Sunday. Still to come tonight, the increasing number of Australians with motor neuron disease and the environmental trigger some scientists think could be causing it. There are studies now showing that people that live beside lakes and rivers where there are frequent algal blooms or cyanobacterial blooms have an increased risk of contracting motor neuron disease. Lawrence has appealed to Indonesian President Joko Widodo to show mercy for the surviving Bali Nine prisoners serving life sentences. The Indonesian leader was today welcomed to Australia ahead of tomorrow's address to Parliament, as Chief Foreign Correspondent Philip Williams reports. For President Joko Widodo, a warm welcome at Government House. This a more formal start of a visit that tomorrow gets down to the gritty business of shared interests, a free trade agreement, strategic cooperation and now coronavirus. Convicted Bali 9 drug smuggler Rene Lawrence is also in Canberra. She won't get to meet the president, but she hopes he hears her heartfelt plea to cap the sentences of the remaining five of the Bali 9 imprisoned for life. We all did something stupid. We all regret it, but everybody deserves a second chance. Renee Lawrence knows what a life sentence feels like. She attempted suicide in an Indonesian jail before her sentence was reduced to 20 years. If this doesn't happen, they've got no hope. They'll lose hope. Is it in effect a death sentence? Yes, I think so. Two of the Bali Nine were executed by firing squad. A third died of cancer in jail. With Rene Lawrence the only one free, she feels compelled to speak up for the other five. Scott Morrison really needs to push for something to be done. And I think this is, while President Jocko is in Australia, I just think that this is a good opportunity. And she says if the sentences must stand, the alternative could be a prisoner exchange between Australia and Indonesia that would relieve the huge burden on families forced to travel overseas to see their loved ones. All suggestions that would need the approval of the Indonesian president. It's unclear if their messages he will hear or act on. Philip Williams, ABC News, Canberra. Car seats are something every family buys when they're expecting a baby. But what happens when more than a million car seats sold every year in Australia are no longer needed? As Amelia Turzon reports, it's become a huge waste problem. And there are moves by the industry now to find a solution. With every new arrival, there's a long list of purchases, including a baby seat. We've been lucky enough not to need one until now. This young family cares about sustainability, but they have no idea what will happen to baby Remy's new car seat after he grows out of it. I'm not really sure exactly what happens, but it's probably not good. 1.2 million new car seats are bought every year in Australia. Children grow out of them quickly, and there are charities who try to rehome used ones with needy families. But safety standards are tight. I've got a car seat. Is it safe? No, sorry, it's too old. There's no recycling scheme, so about 200,000 seats wind up in landfill annually. I feel terrible about the fact that these items end up in landfill and take a long time to break down. Australian car seat manufacturers are trying to do something about their waste problem by working with sustainability consultants on a product stewardship scheme. It's where the, the, the companies that make a product and the retailers uh, raise funds in order to get a better environmental outcome at the disposal point. This scheme would see drop-off points set up across Australia. From there, we would have people who would dismantle the seats and then the various components would be recycled. Australia's three biggest baby car seat manufacturers have now all signed up to the product stewardship scheme. One company wants to go even further and recycle strollers, prams and cots. It would be great to know that um, steps are being taken. 
ensuring a sustainable future for the next generation. Amelia Turzon, ABC News, Melbourne. There'll be fewer famous Batlow apples on supermarket shelves this year and growers are warning it could be a decade before they're back at full production. Some apple growers lost entire orchards in last month's fires and they worry if they can't recover, the ACT town and region will go down with them. Three generations of Duffies from Batlow, now left to pick up the pieces. This apple orchard is surrounded by pine forest and stood little chance. The noise was horrendous. You picked your spot and fought for your life. A season's worth of famous Batlow fruit is withering on these branches. The clean up itself is, is, is huge and um, it's, it's picking up pieces and it's going to take a long time. Dennis and his son Warren have neighbouring farms. Warren lost all but the family home. There are green shoots on some of these trees, but they won't survive. All will eventually be bulldozed. That means starting again, and the next crop will be eight years away. We are going to need help. Um, we can't do it by ourselves. It's impossible. There's not a lot keeping people in Batlow anymore, and if the apple industry happens to um, get depleted in, in, in Batlow, it'll, it'll become a ghost town. Nearby, Terry and Christine Peel are checking on the chestnuts. There you are. One, two, three. Some trees were lost, but most are still standing. The nuts are there. All we do is hope for a bit more rain and, and uh, uh, get them to grow. They'll keep on working the farm and truck the chestnuts to market in Canberra over winter. They're thankful for the income coming in and the community behind them. We hope to, um, to rebuild something as nice as what we had. Rebuilding a life on the land they love. Tom Lowry, ABC News, Batlow. Now to tonight's special report looking at the dramatic rise in the number of people dying from motor neuron disease in Australia and what might be causing it. The number of deaths from this crippling disease has soared over the past 30 years. Across the country, it's estimated more than 2,000 people have it. That's about one in every 11,000. Neuroscientists say this increase can't be put down purely to an ageing population or advances in diagnosis. Some scientists think it could be environmental. One theory is that exposure to toxins produced by blue-green algae might be a trigger. Algal blooms are a common problem in many regional waterways, particularly when it's hot and dry. As Rachel Carbonell explains, there are now growing calls for this potential link to be investigated. So this photo sums us up. For Tim Trembath, riding his motorbike alongside his wife Karen used to be one of life's great joys. He can't anymore because he has motor neurone disease, or MND which causes progressive muscle weakness and eventually paralysis. Losing the function of your limbs is just horrible. You know, there's a real kick in the guts. He wants to know what caused it. Just too many people getting this type of disease. 10% of cases are inherited. For the other 90%, like Tim, there's no known cause. A number of scientists are investigating whether the reason for these sporadic cases increasing is environmental. They're looking into a range of potential factors, including pesticides and heavy metals. But one of the suspected triggers is a toxin produced by blue-green algae called BMAA. There are studies now showing that people that live beside lakes and rivers where there are frequent algal blooms or cyanobacterial blooms have an increased risk of contracting motor neurone disease. Rachel Dunlop has been studying the neurotoxin here and in the US. She says international research shows a correlation. That doesn't mean that we have evidence for a direct cause. And I want to emphasise that just like people that smoke don't necessarily get lung cancer, this is probably a risk factor. A lot of people live near lakes with algal blooms, but not everyone gets MND. But there are definitely hotspots of MND around the world. It's been identified in France, in the US, and we believe there could be one in New South Wales. 
The prevalence of MND in Griffith in the New South Wales Riverina district is estimated to be about five times the national average. I think there's no one in this town that wouldn't know someone who's already passed away from this terrible disease or, the, or someone who's currently suffering from it. The town is close by to Lake Wyangan, which is prone to blue-green algal blooms. The area has become a focus for some scientists looking into whether the toxin BMAA plays a role in triggering motor neurone disease in some people. Is BMAA a direct cause of all motor neurone disease? I think that's unlikely. Is it a contributing factor to some sporadic motor neurone disease? I think that's highly likely. Professor Dominic Rose says there's a lack of nationwide data on possible MND clusters in Australia. He says MND is not a notifiable disease, so identifying areas with potentially high rates of MND and what environmental triggers might be at play is difficult. We should do everything possible to try and work out whether this is a contributing factor to motor neurone disease. It's not just good enough, I don't think, to just go, oh well, I don't know. New South Wales Health says there can be big variations in MND between areas and over time, and there's no definitive evidence of a causational link between blue-green algal toxins and the disease. This is Lake Kajeligo, about 130 kilometres up the road from Griffith. This town, which shares its name with the lake, has a population of about 1,400 people. But in recent years, four residents here have developed the usually rare motor neurone disease. In a small town like Lake Jellico, to have four or maybe five cases is it's too much. Tim Trembath is one of the Lake Jellico residents with MND. He wants more funding for scientists to probe possible environmental triggers for the disease. As far as the connection between that blue-green algae and my disease, I'm, I'm hoping that they find a connection because I think if they find a connection, they'll find a cure. If they disprove it, they can go, you know, spend their resources some looking somewhere else. It's just one of the many mysteries of MND that all those affected by the disease would like to see solved. Rachel Carbonell, ABC News. To sport now, and in the AFLW, Collingwood has defeated expansion side the West Coast Eagles at Victoria Park. Meanwhile at Moorabbin, the Western Bulldogs got their season off to the perfect start against the Saints in front of 8,000 fans with a 25-point win. St Kilda's first outing at Moorabbin boasted a capacity crowd and fanfare to match. The Saints have come home and a new era begins. But it was the Western Bulldogs marching in with Bonnie Too Good living up to her name with two first quarter goals. And she's got two. American Danielle Marshall impressed with her first disposal. The Americans on the board with her first kick in footy. Molly McDonald soon gave Saints fans a reason to cheer. Former Gaelic footballer Ashling McCarthy complimented the Bulldogs' international flavour with a major of her own as the 2018 Premiers opened their account. McCarthy, a flying shot at goal. It's good. At Victoria Park, West Coast Eagles star recruit Dana Hooker got the new side off to a good start. Throws it on the boot. Collingwood's Chloe Malloy missed all of last year with a foot injury. She made a statement on her return. A sharp shooter, Chloe Malloy. Former Blue Brianna Davies' day out was cut short when she went down with a lower leg injury. Davies, she's grabbing her knee. But the pies persisted, buoyed by former Australian netball captain Sharni Layton, who kicked her first ever AFLW goal. And it's a goal! Collingwood securing a 27-point win. Wooden Spooners last year, they're showing a bit of promise in 2020. It's their first round one victory. Round one! Catherine Murphy, ABC News. Australian golfer Minwoo Lee has won his first professional title at the Victorian Open at 13th Beach. The 21-year-old finished with a birdie on the final hole for a four under par 68 in windy conditions to finish with a total of 19 under, two shots ahead of New Zealander Ryan Fox. His sister Minji Lee, who was watching on, won the title in 2014 and 2018. There's a lot of people out here and I just got to thank them. Um, 
yeah, just played awesome and proud of myself. The women's event finished in a three-way playoff. It took four playoff holes to decide the winner, with He Young Park securing victory. Australia has qualified for the final of the women's T20 tri-series with a victory over England at Junction Oval in Melbourne. Beth Mooney top scored with 50 and Sophie Moulinou took three wickets in Australia's 16-run win. There is a lot on the line, particularly for the team in green. Australia needed to win to stay alive in the tournament but made a poor start as Elisa Healy's run of low scores continued. She's hold out. You can't believe it. England had the home team in a spin. It's knocked her over. Brilliantly bowled again. Captain Meg Lanning went cheaply. Oh, she's gone. Elise Perry departed in similar style. Oh, she's got her. Beth Mooney made a measured half century before she became the latest batter to hear the death rattle. Uh, well, that solves that. Australia set England a modest 133 for victory. Uh, another change of pace. The pure pace of Taylor Valamic shook up the English top order and slowed the run chase. Oh, that's straight through it. What a ball. The Australian spinners took over with a helping hand from Healy. Oh, he's got it. After a loss to India, Australia's preparations for this month's T20 World Cup are back on track. The runs might not be coming for Healy, but the catches are. Oh, that flew to Elisa Healy. The 16-run victory knocked England out of the tri-series. The wicket was actually keeping a little bit low and there was lots of bolts in LBs today, so we adjusted pretty quickly with the ball and it was a great effort with the ball. I thought all our bowls did a great job. Australia will face India in the final on Wednesday. Duncan Huntsdale, ABC News. Some of cricket's biggest names have returned to the field for the Big Appeal game in Melbourne. Teams captained by retired legends Adam Gilchrist and Ricky Ponting faced off in a light-hearted contest. 50-year-old West Indian Brian Lara showed that he's lost none of his skill. Oh, Lara opens up on the offside. That's the shot of the afternoon by the Prince. Revolt living his dream, bowling to Brian Lara, who just oh. crunches him through the covers and another boundary for Lara. Elise Perry bowled an over to Indian great Sachin Tendulkar during the innings break. Ponting's team recorded a one-run win, but the result was secondary to the primary focus of raising money for communities impacted by bushfires. In baseball, the Melbourne Aces have clinched the championship series with another win over the Adelaide Giants. The Aces had the momentum after winning Game 1 in Melbourne and took the lead in Game 2 last night in Adelaide. They then piled on three runs in the fifth innings to take the title. Lined into centre field, Robinson is there and the drought is over. The Melbourne Aces, ABL champions for 2020. It's Melbourne's first title in the modern Australian Baseball League. Some of Australia's leading female athletes are learning the art of sports commentary in a push to get more diversity behind the microphone. It's part of a new program being funded by Sport Australia as the number of games being broadcast soars. Usually, Alicia Lucas is making plays on the field, not calling them. This week, the 27-year-old has been part of an all-female sports commentary workshop funded by Sport Australia. Charge down! from South Africa, but England regained the ball. To get a concrete basics and foundation block of what it takes to be a broadcast commentator in both play-by-play -play and expert commentary is really exciting. Ten athletes are learning the ropes as various codes make a play to get more of their leading female voices behind the microphone. This course isn't about these females commentating on female sport. This is actually changing the face of what sports commentary looks like. Rugby Australia is one of the supporters of the program. Fittingly, the voice of rugby, Gordon Bray, is one of the program's mentors. He has the feet. Oh. He has the step. Oh, magnificent. Wow. That magnificent. is the web Ellis Cup. I think the message I'll be getting across is there are no shortcuts. Um, it's all about hard work. In my early days at the ABC, I used to go out to the old Sydney sports ground with a tape recorder and call the rugby league match of the day in my own time on a Sunday. Sports commentary has certainly changed a lot in recent years. It's no longer just about a group of people sitting way up in the grandstand calling a handful of games every year. These days, sporting governing bodies have to broadcast hundreds of matches. 
Many of them are streamed online. A few years ago, we weren't talking about Aon Uni 7s, we weren't talking about Bill Corp Super W um, and our under 18s program, National Youth Champs, and they're all opportunities that we can have commentary around. We have experienced and played at that highest level, so to be able to give that insight and to provide the viewer with an experience they're not going to get, and so that's something I really took a hold of. In Lucas's case, defending her side's rugby sevens gold at the Tokyo Olympics is the main focus for now. Then she'll make a call on what comes next. Patrick Galloway, ABC News. This afternoon, the seaside town of Port Ferry got out the jazz hands in a bid to dance its way to global recognition. Organisers of the town's jazz festival hatched an ambitious plan to get more than a thousand people dancing the Charleston along the town's main street. Daniel Miles strapped on his dancing shoes and went along for a look. Fire up the time machine. Port Ferry's going back in time. It's 100 years since the Charleston took the world by storm and these women think that's about long enough. No, it should come back. It should so make a comeback. Catherine Hoof is the mastermind behind that comeback. She needs 1,096 people to shimmy and jive down Port Ferry's main street to cement a spot in the Guinness Book of World Records, which is no small task. One third of the town's population will need to be dancing to break the record. Hands on your hips, round we go. Some people might need to shut their shops for half an hour of the day. <laughs> that would be great. Nikki Clapham's made sure there's no excuse not to pull on your dancing shoes. She's choreographed both sitting and standing versions of the dance. It's about being inclusive and about people having the opportunity to come and dance if they want to. Oh my goodness, it was the most fun I've had for such a long time. It is the best feeling and I, I, I cannot dance. <laughs> the record count itself is serious stuff. Wristbands are scanned and judges work overtime, keeping an eye on around 50 competitors each to ensure no one stops dancing during the attempt. The dance itself runs for about 5 minutes 20 seconds. There's about 12 different sections of choreography. But there's a catch. If you stop at any time, you're disqualified. So there's plenty on the line for this jiving group of jazz fans. In the end, the bean counters declared there weren't enough dancers present, meaning the record remains out of reach, for this year at least. If we can do something to bring happiness uh, and a bit of relief um, to some pretty tough times, yeah, it's pretty wonderful. <laughs> Proving sometimes laughter and dance really is the best medicine. Daniel Miles, ABC News, Port Ferry. Time for the weather now. Here's Paul Higgins. And we can actually do a dance here. Could be a nice <laughs> shiny new floor for us. Melbourne all weekend isn't great to breathe, but it's made for some stunning sunrises. We had a mild night staying above 22 at Albury Wodonga, but down as low as 7 at Falls Creek. Showers began to move down from New South Wales into our east today. We've had around 10 to 15 millimetres so far on the ranges. Strong winds along the coast. Today's hotspots were in the Wimmera, 32 degrees at Horsham, Nil and at Warwick Nabeel. It was a muggy day for the St Kilda Festival here in Melbourne, the city high of 28.2 at 1.41 this afternoon. And right now outside we have a temperature of 23 degrees. There's been more than 200 millimetres of rain over the past uh, few 36 hours in Sydney, 200 millimetres in 24 hours on the Gold Coast. Meanwhile, former cyclone Damien is steadily moving across the west. That spiral south of the bite is a deep low, but we're watching this big mass of cloud associated with a coastal pressure trough being fed by these moist easterly winds. The trough will actually move away to the south tomorrow to be off our east coast and moving away on Tuesday. So tomorrow, eastern Victoria will have some rain. It'll be especially useful over our firegrounds in the far east. More rain tomorrow for Brisbane and Sydney, another 15 to 30 millimetres in Canberra up to 45 millimetres and in Hobart late rain, Perth and Adelaide will be sunny.
Back home, showers continuing to move into eastern Victoria overnight, tending to rain out here in the far east, up to 60 millimetres until mid tomorrow afternoon. Dry in our far west, a shower or two elsewhere, mostly over central and eastern areas. Isolated thunderstorms over our north and far east and a humid and partly cloudy day. And there is warnings of uh, that heavy rainfall in far east Gippsland. On the bays, a southeasterly to 30 knots, turning easterly 15 to 20 knots in the morning and a gale warning for Port Phillip and the east Gippsland coast. Get ready for some showers moving into Melbourne during the morning. It'll be a humid and hazy day, a top temperature of 26 degrees on the way with 2 to 6 millimetres of rain. After that, expecting a few more showers again on Tuesday and Wednesday, but a fine day on Thursday, Tam. Thank you very much, Paul. And that's it for this evening's bulletin. I hope you liked our new set tonight. I'll be back tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. Until then, good night.